Coming up, we are just a few days into the new year and we are looking ahead at what we can expect from the Hoosier economy in 2020. Ball State's Mike Hicks is here with his forecast for growth and what he sees as the big storylines in the year ahead. Plus, voice and natural language interactions becoming the norm for how we interact with technology. We'll talk with the CEO of Conversite.ai about his company's vision to make data more available for companies through conversational insights. And Brownsburg undergoing a major transformation with the creation of a town center. Leadership from Flaherty and Collins Properties uh, will explain how the Arbuckle, a $40 million mixed-use development, is key to attracting people to downtown Brownsburg. Details on those stories and much more ahead on this edition of Inside Indiana Business. Hello and welcome to Inside Indiana Business. I'm Gary Dick and Happy New Year. Happy 2020. Well, last year in 2019, we saw a lot, lots of jobs announcements, including substantial international investment in our state. There were also some job cuts, notably Cummins announcing plans to slash more than 2,000 jobs company-wide. But what we can, can we expect for the Indiana economy in 2020? Center for Business and Economic Research at Ball State, the director of that institute, Mike Hicks. He's here now with his forecast for the year ahead. Mike, as always, welcome back and Happy New Year Happy to you. Happy New Year to you. Okay, let's look, before we look ahead, let's look back because 2019 was an eventful year again. Lots of jobs announcements, a budget surplus, lots of positives. Also, a lot of manufacturing job losses too. Right, well, if we look back even over a decade, we're now at full 10 years of mm -hmm. economic recovery never happened before. Uh, and so Indiana's done fairly well. We've added jobs each year. We've added manufacturing jobs since 2010. And so maybe this year is an anomalous. Mm -hmm. Maybe after 10 years of growth, maybe there's just a quick pause in manufacturing. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so as we look at this year, you know, job growth, uh, negative maybe mm -hmm. 10,000 manufacturing jobs, but doesn't seem to spill over in anything else. So mm -hmm. we've had a reasonably good year despite the factory job losses. Looking into next year, probably a little bit slower growth mm -hmm. than 2019, but no huge warning signs mm -hmm. anywhere in our economy. Good. One thing that stood out to me because it's been such a big issue in our state for a number of years, and that's income growth. And that, uh, that's a, a positive for 2019. Well, just the last quarter growth, yeah. Indiana led the Midwest in income growth. It was a huge piece of good news. Now, nationally, we know over the past 18 months or so, we've been seeing wage growth that has been largely absent from this recovery. We've seen it coming everywhere, particularly in the lower wage sector. So we're beginning to see wage pressure in those mm -hmm. Uh, you know, very tight labor market. Yeah. So that's great news. That keeps employment uh, sustained throughout the year in those areas where, where households are consuming. Pretty good Christmas season, I think, yeah. here in Indiana and everywhere else. So that's fantastic news and sort of gives the a, a sense that maybe the economy isn't stalling as we thought maybe six months ago. Well, let's look ahead because there are some on the national uh, scene you're predicting uh, maybe a, you know an economic slowdown, some even talking recession. What do you see in the tea leaves, especially as it relates to Indiana? Right. Well, it's hard to read the tea leaves. Yeah. Uh, the model, you, I just cannot force it into recession. Yeah. There's just too much consumer confidence. Um, even with the manufacturing job losses, as I said, they're not spilling over into the rest of the economy as we would have expected 10 years or 30 years ago. So part of that could just be a natural progression, manufacturing sort of adjusting to a new environment after a decade of growth. Uh, so I think we'll probably see growth just under 2%. Um, I think we're going to continue to see wage growth as those labor markets remain very tight. Um, I think we'll see some pockets of di difficult times. We've had a bad year in the RV industry, for mm -hmm. example. It probably will rebound a bit this year. And so I don't see any real problems. I think we'll end the year with a budget surplus. Mm -hmm. If the trade war could be ended, we're going to have a, a pretty good year. When unemployment rate's down to under 3.5%, it's, it's hard to see fast growth. Where are the workers going to come from mm -hmm. to, to fuel a huge expansion? 
as you look at storylines in the year ahead in 2020, uh, as you and I were talking off camera, talent and keeping talent, attracting talent, going to continue to be a big issue, right, here in Indianapolis, but really in every corner of the state. Well, that's our that's our number one issue here in Indiana. Um, we. The jobs that were created over this long recovery have not been as robust. There have been more concentrated in low-wage sectors. Again, some of that may be changing with the wage growth, but, but we cannot fuel a big modern economy without more of those college-educated folks staying. So what's happening in central Indiana, which is absorbing more than 100% of the growth of the state, really has to extend to the rest of the state. The governor's mentioned that in his, his concern over growth hitting every corner of the state. Uh, but I think that's really the talent attraction focus on talent like the Greensburg story mm -hmm. yep. are, are all part of where we're now headed in economic development. And a final question too as we get into rural Indiana too some some challenging areas though when it comes to to job creation and talent all those issues we talk about maybe a bit easier it's happening in metro areas but the rural areas face some challenges. Right all the the job growth in Indiana is happening in the these uh, two or three metro areas mm -hmm. and and the advantage Indiana has over the rest of the nation where let's be plain rural has really struggled mm -hmm. is that we're a compact state. You're not more than 40 minutes from a city anywhere. Yeah. So that's a happy story for much of Indiana. I think it give us a better rural fruit future than, say, Iowa or South Dakota. All right. A uh, fairly positive outlook for 2020. Mike Hicks, as always, thanks for being here. I know you're going to join you. us on The Insiders a little bit later. So Be we'll around. see you then. All right. Well, Inc. Magazine has released its annual Surge Cities list. Indianapolis earning the number 50 spot on that list, which the publication calls a guidebook of the best 50 cities in America for starting a business. The magazine says Indy's net business and job creation and population growth were all moderate, which could explain why the city dropped uh, to number 50 on the list from number 25 last year. Austin, Texas took top honors on the list, followed by Salt Lake City, Durham, North Carolina, Denver, and Boise. Well, if the past few years are any indication, the next decade will see even more growth in the use of artificial intelligence in a variety of business settings. Up next, we find out Indianapolis-based Conversite.ai's use of the human voice is attra attracting attention and investment. It's time now to go inside innovation, brought to you by Allegiant, pioneering safety. Well, Conversite.ai says its artificial intelligence platform allows sales and service teams to gather real-time insights, automate busy work, and answer customer questions instantly. The CEO of the company, uh, Ganesh Gandhi Ishwaran, is here now with details on growth opportunities for the young Indianapolis uh, tech company that is also attracting some fundi, uh, funding as well. And Ganesh, welcome to the program. Thank you. Okay, Thank you. artificial intelligence, it's everywhere. It's, everybody's talking about it. Yep. But as you talk about artificial intelligence in a business setting, what, is, what does it really mean? How are companies using artificial intelligence? Artificial intelligence has multiple flavor, like us human. Artificial intelligence could see, like on the road, mm -hmm. or can talk, like how you and me are talking. So we are focusing on that second part, which is natural conversation. Mm -hmm. Just like how you and me are talking, mm -hmm. can we talk to our systems? Mm -hmm. We all, all these business, large manufacturing distribution companies have tons of data yeah. in their systems. Is there a way? We can talk to that data yeah. just naturally. Yeah. So naturally, and that's the, uh, the, your kind of your unique selling proposition is using natural language conversation yep. to really extract the information and learning how and, and being able to leverage all this this reams of data and uh, and analytics. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. How does that happen? Give me an example of how your technology works. So we have a mobile app. Um, take your app. You know who are my top ten customers mm -hmm. for last month, and how much inventory we have for this item. So if I'm the salesperson, in friend of a customer, and customer, hey, can you guys deliver this on Friday? Okay, I need to know I have inventory or not. So I can make a phone call to somebody in the warehouse or take my phone, ask Athena, mm -hmm. which is our AI companion. Mm -hmm. So ask, hey Athena, how much inventory we have for the forklift, one, two, three, four? Athena will tell you there are 42, can deliver by Friday. 
Yeah, so, so your, your technology basically enables that, literally that conversation to occur to extract the data and the analytics. Yes. Yeah. One portion of it is you ask a question, Athena will respond, but then Athena is also learning. AI, uh -huh. we're learning, okay, this is a question, this is the information you are asking every day. Mm -hmm. In the morning, Athena will give you that insights proactively that, okay, you have $700,000 inventory in this warehouse instead of 600000 mm -hmm. So Athena will monitor some of those metrics, more like news, mm -hmm. business insights as a news. In the morning, Athena will come and tell you. Mm -hmm. Athena will always be available as on demand, but also yeah. intelligent enough to tell you when you need something. Yeah, let's talk about uh, the potential for growth because you're attracting attention. Yep. Uh, the company received, uh, I think it was $700,000 in funding from Elevate Ventures, so people are interested. And you're specifically, or mainly in the manufacturing and logistics uh, sectors. Where yeah. do you see growth opportunities? Yeah, we are just starting um, natural language and conversation is going to be everything. Every application we see today, mm -hmm. where you go to a screen and using it, all going to have a natural language and voice Mm -hmm. interaction, mm -hmm. same way how we move to mobile. Mm -hmm. That's going to happen in the next five to 10 years. Mm -hmm. We are already seeing from 2017, day one, to today, we have close to 35 customers now, some of them are large Fortune 500 customers. Mm -hmm. uh, we have uh, customers all over North America right now, and we are also in the process of expanding through our partners to global. Space. All right, we'll be following the story. Conversite.ai is the company founded in 2017. Ganesh Gandhi Warren, thank you very much. We'll have you back on. Thank too. you. Thanks a lot. Yeah, look forward yeah. to it. Yep, thank you. Well, for nearly 60 years, the Indiana Retail Council has been the legislative voice and a champion for the state's retailers. And as the new year begins, the organization under new leadership, new Retail Council Executive Director Melissa Coxie is here to share her vision. Here's what's making news now around Indiana. Indiana's manufacturing jobs took a dip through the first 11 months of 2019. Our partners at WFYI report the state lost nearly 8,000 manufacturing jobs through November. According to that report, Indiana hasn't lost more manufacturing jobs than it added over a calendar year since 20, or 2009. Governor Eric Holcomb says the numbers that he feels are reflective of a changing economy, adding that Indiana remains among the most manufacturing intensive states in the nation. South Bend-based AM General has been awarded a more than $50 million contract from the U.S. Department of Defense. The DOD says the contract calls for hardware support to reset and upgrade a fleet of high-mobility multi-wheeled vehicles, and it will be performed in Amman, Jordan. The project slated for completion in December. Gary, Chicago International Airport has reached a major milestone. The airport officially celebrating the 100th international flight at its General Aviation and Customs and Border Protection Facility. That facility allows travelers to visit the airport without first needing to clear customs at other locations. Since opening in the fall of 2018, officials say the facility is averaging about eight international flights per month. Well, the Indiana Retail Council is a nonprofit trade uh, association that for nearly 60 years has been the voice for the state's retail community. And with the retirement of longtime President Grant Monahan, the organization begins the new year with new leadership. I'm pleased to be joined by the new executive director of the Indiana Retail Council, Melissa Coxey. And Melissa, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me. And this literally is your first day on the job. It so is literally brand, my brand new. <laughs> well, interesting. You have an interesting background. Most recently came uh, from the Indianapolis Metropolitan Police Department, serving uh, as legal counsel there. You practice law at Bose, McKinney, and Evans. Also commissioner of the Indiana Alcohol and Tobacco Commission. So your background would would makes a lot of sense for this position. What attracted you to this position to lead? the Retail Council? So I've, I've actually done work with the Retail Council previously, and one of the things I love about um, working with Indiana retailers is it's the perfect intersection between my professional and personal life. Um, I have, um, I'm a mom, and as a mom, I can tell you that Indiana retailers impact our lives in such a uh, Profound ways. Profound really, ways, in, that's in right, that's yeah. right. And, and, and I think that's reflective too, as we were talking off camera, 
of the types of, of, of membership you have, the types of retail. When you talk about the Indiana Retail Council, talk about the different sectors or the different kinds of retailers that you represent. We represent the largest um, chain mm -hmm. nationwide retailers from across mm -hmm. the country. But you know, in Indiana, we Hoosiers are lucky because we are innovators. Mm -hmm. And so we have lots of members that are individual retailers around mm -hmm. the state. You touch on and represent retailers on a, a wide variety of issues. Sunday sales, alcohol sales, a net, one of the big high profile issues that is reflective of the kinds of issues that, uh, that you uh, get active in. That's absolutely right. The mm -hmm. Indiana Retail Council was um, instrumental mm -hmm. in um, that initiative at the State House. Yeah. As you look at, I mentioned Grant Monahan uh, in the open there, the longtime leader, I think four decades yeah. uh, in a leadership role at the Indiana Retail Council. He has certainly uh, left his mark on the organization that, that you're now taking over. For sure. Yeah. Grant has incredibly big shoes to fill. He has done an amazing job um, telling the story of Indiana retail. Mm -hmm. uh, we know that there is more of a story to tell. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why I would like to reach out across the state to smaller retailers that traditionally have not had a voice mm -hmm. at the state house and get them involved in uh, policy in a way they maybe haven't in the past. No, no big issues out there. It's a short session of the legislature, so not really big issues. But as you mentioned, which I think is interesting, is that mix of large retailers and the smaller mm -hmm. uh, retailers and giving all of those retailers a voice. That's absolutely right. Mm -hmm. um, it, I think that there are so many innovators out there, um, retailers across the state of Indiana, that can be brought to the table and have mm -hmm. a voice um, with respect to their regulation. Mm -hmm. Final question, we'll have about uh, 20 seconds, but the importance of the retail industry, that sector of the economy is, is really big. I think people don't, don't really think about it that much, but it's an important part of the Indiana economy. It, retailers are the number one employers throughout the mm -hmm. state of Indiana. Mm -hmm. All right. The new head of the Indiana Retail Council, Melissa Cox. And Melissa, thanks for joining us. Look forward to having you on the show again in the future. Great. Thanks so much. All right. Well, a popular restaurant in Brown County is closing for a few months to rebrand. Big Woods Restaurant says the original Big Woods in Nashville will reopen in March as a new concept. The company says uh, this spring uh, will mark the launch of the original a Big Woods Restaurant and feature new decor, regional comfort foods and drinks. Big Woods Restaurants also has locations in Franklin Speedway and Bloomington with new locations coming this year to Noblesville and Westfield. Coming up next, a potential game changer for downtown Brownsburg. The Arbuckle is a $40 million mixed-use development and the first piece of a major ongoing uh, effort in the Hendricks County community. Darren Kittner from uh, developer Flaherty and Collins is here with details. He's in the Inside Indiana Business Social Media Lounge, and he'll be uh, with us shortly with details. Well, downtown Brownsburg is getting a new look with the Arbuckle, a $40 million mixed-use development in the center of town. Flaherty and Collins the Properties broke ground on the project in 2017. Residents already moving in there. And with more on a project that includes 210 luxury market rate uh, apartment homes, a town homes, retail space, and a 400 space parking garage, pleased to be joined by Flaherty and Collins Properties General Counsel, Darren Kittner. And Darren, welcome to the program. Thank, thank you, Gary. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, let's talk about this development. Uh, yeah. Brownsburg, a small, uh, smaller Hendricks County community. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a big investment, a big project right in the heart of downtown. Right in the heart. And, and you said it was small, but it is growing and yeah. has been growing for a while. Uh, growing a lot with the, the single family homes, uh, families moving there for their schools and whatnot. Uh, but what the what, what the town was looking for was to really do something to bolster their downtown, mm -hmm. create an identity, and uh, really attract and retain residents. Yeah. Um, and, and the Arbuckle is what resulted. Forty million dollar project. Give us a thumbnail description of the Arbuckle. Really, what it's all about. Yeah. So it is a, a luxury apartment uh, development, and it is uh, you know there's been a, a lot of apartment growth here in Indianapolis, the Indianapolis market. It is a project you could pick up, put in downtown Indianapolis, and it would be among the best uh, uh, residential opportunities in downtown Indianapolis. So it is uh, 
uh, something that is unique to Brownsburg and uh, offers mm -hmm. you know the, the high-end luxury living mm -hmm. as well as all the amenities people today are looking for whether they're, they're young professionals looking for an urban living environment or even empty nesters who mm -hmm. are ready to, to sell their home and move into something a little easier and, and right in the thick of the action. And this is really part of a strategy in Brownsburg aimed at, at keeping people, keeping talent and also attracting people to grow that population base. A absolutely. Um, there, there's still plenty of people who move to Brownsburg and, and buy homes, but those looking for a, a different sort of, of living uh, uh, option mm -hmm. without a project like the Arbuckle wouldn't be looking at Brownsburg. So what we see in our projects uh, th that we do these all across the Midwest is typically 50% uh, or more of the residents are, are new to a, mm. a community. Mm -hmm. So, um, and, and they're also high income individuals and that's exactly what cities and towns across the state are looking mm -hmm. to attract and retain. Some people might be surprised at a development of this nature in a Brownsburg, but what we're seeing in Flaherty and Collins is, is really at the forefront of this. These types of developments going on around the state in, in communities all over Indiana. Absolutely. Uh, you, know, you name it, probably yeah. it's a community who would like a, a development like this. We have, have done projects, uh, similar, certainly a lot of projects in downtown Indianapolis and <laughs> in about every large yeah. city in the Midwest, but we have Kokomo, New Albany, Elkhart, Mishawaka, Fishers, um, mm -hmm. Brownsburg, and projects coming in LaPorte and Lawrenceburg, mm -hmm. and I hope I haven't left any out, yeah. but uh, there, there's a lot of communities who are looking for this, this way for them to grow in this kind of new new era yeah. we're in. Well, you talked about growth, and also is, is part of it too, communities wanting to create an identity, uh, really a, a, a brand, Absolutely, if you absolutely. Yeah. Uh, you've seen what happened in Fishers. Mm -hmm. You know, they wanted to create a, a downtown, an identity, mm -hmm. and it started with our project, the Depot. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I can't list all the projects that have come thereafter, but certainly that's a, a, a prime example, and, and, and Brownsburg is similar. Yeah, would you see this trend continuing, these types of developments in, in, in communities? I do. Um, you know, they, I think communities are realizing that in order to attract and retain uh, residents, they need to kind of diversify their housing options, and this is one of the ways to do that. All right. Darren Kintner is a general counsel, also the lead developer on the Arbuckle in uh, Brownsburg. And uh, Darren, thanks for, thanks for joining us, and we look forward to following the progress. Great. Thank you, Gary. All right. Well, the new year means that you now have a new way to watch our show, WFYI programming, now streaming live on YouTube TV. If you can't watch Inside Indiana Business at its regularly scheduled time on WFYI at 7 on Friday evenings, you uh, YouTube TV subscribers can watch our show there as well as uh, all of your other WFYI favorites. Well, hot yoga, it is increasingly popular. Uh, uh, increasingly popular form of fitness and a central indiana company is cashing in on its popularity we'll tell you about the secret to the success of indianapolis based the hot room including big plans for expansion outside of the state and we will also look ahead to the year in sports in indiana and how uh, playing host to big games means big bucks for business stay with us Well, one of the most common New Year's resolutions is to exercise more. For fitness-focused Hoosiers, an Indianapolis-based yoga company called The Hot Room is opening more locations, including its first expansion outside of the state. Business of Health reporter Kylie Valletta has more. Kylie. That's right, Gary. An Indianapolis entrepreneur opened The Hot Room in Indy in 2013, and the yoga studio has stretched its business to three studios now, including its first out-of-state near Chicago. But there are more on the way in central Indiana as well. Here to tell us about her growing company is Hajin Kalgankar, the owner of The Hot Room. Thanks so much for coming today. Thank you so much for having me. So it's New Year's. We all feel like we have to like detox from the holidays. <laughs> Fitness is on the mind. So let's talk first about the health benefits of hot yoga in particular. Well, yoga in general, moving your body in that way is very therapeutic and healing. And then you add the element of heat to it and it really just intensifies and elevates the benefits that you receive. You'll be able to move your body with more ease because your body is warmed up. Uh, your heart rate goes up so you get more of a cardio, more intense workout. And also there's this mental toughness that you gain because it is a challenge, right? Like mentally, physically. And so you'll be able to come out of the class feeling like you can do anything after you do a hot yoga class. 
Yes. Right, you used an analogy <laughs> of a glass blower, which yes. I really liked. Yeah, so if you think about it, glass blowers will take the glass and then they'll heat it up to create the shapes, right? Mm -hmm. Essentially the same thing that we're doing. We're going to warm up the body, warm up the muscles, and then it's easier to create the shapes, the yoga poses, which is really good for beginners. The heat is such a great tool for beginners who have never done yoga. Right, okay, so let's talk about your locations because you are growing for sure. You have st two studios in Indianapolis right now, and then you have this third one that you just recently opened in Chicago. Also have one under construction in Fishers. Mm -hmm. What do you think has allowed your company to grow like that? First of all, what we do is so transformative and when people do the practice and they see the huge mental and physical transformations and they access their most powerful lives they want to share it with everyone right and so we've built this community that is just as passionate as myself and my team that wants to share it with as many people as possible and make it accessible to anyone especially beginners so people get hooked is what you're saying. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, there's, you get addicted. <laughs> so what can you tell us about the other locations possibly coming to the central Indiana area? Yeah, so we certainly have a location coming down on the south side in Greenwood. We've already announced that. And then we have a couple more locations to come within Indianapolis in 2020. And we just recently expanded out onto Chicago's North Shore with the Hot Room North Shore. Very good. Okay, so uh, a big trend in fitness right now is uh, working out at home. You know, the Pelotons of the world where you... Mm -hmm don't even have to leave your house to get your workout. So uh, is it a challenge competing with those types of online don't leave your house programs right now? Yeah, so I do online workouts too. The ease and convenience of it is definitely a benefit. But here's the deal is that it's actually helped our business grow even more so because now more and more people are interested in learning about how to improve their health and wellness. More people are wanting to improve their quality of life, right? And so they'll start maybe in the online world and then they'll quickly notice that they're looking for something more. They're looking for community, more inspiration, more accountability, more face-to-face -face human interaction mm -hmm. that creates friendships. And then now they come to our studio and they get a totally unique experience um, that they can't get in the online world. And you mentioned one key part of your mission is really sort of debunking this stigma of what a yogi or a person who practices yoga, uh, what they are. So explain sort of how you try to, you have diversity in your clientele. So much diversity. We are so proud of our community that we've built. It consists of all ages, shapes, sizes, diverse backgrounds. We wanna make this practice as accessible to anyone and really anyone can do it. I know we had talked about it earlier. All you have to do for first class is just breathe. Everything else is optional, right? And then you just start doing more and more of the practice. So anyone can do it and that's really important uh, part of our business model and also our culture. And when you wanted to expand, uh, why did you look outside Indiana? Uh, why Chicago? Well, more and more people were coming to us, right? And saying they started in Indianapolis practicing and they're moving other places and bring the hot room here. There's nothing like the hot room. In. So our idea is now, how do we make this accessible to anyone who wants it? Mm -hmm. And expanding outside of our local geography and showing that this business model works is a step to, towards that goal. And just a few seconds left, but a big emphasis right now too on mental health and mm. um, you know, just more mindfulness is, do you think that's helping to drive people into yoga? Majority of people's day, people are like locked on their screen, whether it be phones or in the computers. And for that one hour a day, people are disconnecting and gaining more mental clarity mm -hmm. and more mindfulness and just more awareness of mind-body connection. And that in itself is a huge benefit and more and more people are looking for that. All right, well, good luck with all your expansion. We're excited to follow you and uh, see where you're going next. Thank you so much for having me. Sure, <laughs> Gary, back to you. All right, Kelly, thank you. Well, Indianapolis-based Eli Lilly and Company has received another favorable ruling regarding the patent for its vitamin uh, regimen, uh, Limta. A U.S. District Court uh, has ruled that a competitor, a Toronto-based company, Apotex Inc., cannot launch alternative salt forms of the vitamin regimen before Lilly's patent expires in 2022. Lilly calls uh, the drug is uh, a first treatment to fight non-small cell lung cancer. Still ahead, our insiders will sound off on some of Indiana's top stories in 2019. Also look ahead to 2020. But first, we look ahead to the year in sports. From the start of the Penske era at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway to what lies ahead for the Indianapolis Colts. Bill Benner and I will break it all down next Inside Indiana Sports.
Well, the new year promises to bring yet another big year in Indiana sports. March Madness will bring both the Big Ten and Horizon League men's and women's tournaments to Indianapolis, as well as another NCAA regional, the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, the Indy 500, all under the direction of Roger Penske for the first time. The Pacers hope uh, for the long-awaited return of Victor Oladipo and a playoff run. And how do the Colts respond after not making the postseason? Here now to talk about these topics and more, our Inside Indiana Sports reporter, Bill Benner. Bill, as always, welcome. Thanks, Gary. Happy New Year. And happy New Year. Happy New Year. Uh, 2019 was a big year. Let's look back. I mentioned Ro Roger Pinsky. I think the big story, sports or otherwise, for as long as I can remember, was the news that Roger Penske, his group, buying the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Well, I don't think there's any question about it. In fact, yeah. that, that may have, that's as big a sports news as we've had probably since the Colts or the yeah. NCAA moved to Indianapolis. Uh, just has will have a huge impact uh, moving forward as we get into 2020, uh, and it'll be very interesting to see how he, no pun intended, steps on the gas and and starts making significant moves to both the physical plan of the Indianapolis mm -hmm. Motor Speedway and to the IndyCar series in general. What is your feel on that? I hear and I get the, the kind of the vibe that that and, and the kind of person he is and an executive he is that if there are moves to be made he's going to he's going to make he's not going to wait. Well he, no he's not going to wait yeah. and th again this is a guy who's built his career by attention to detail by being the best in class mm -hmm. and I guarantee he will bring those same standards in, to the Indianapolis Motor Speedway and the IndyCar. All right let's talk about our professional other professional franchises first uh, the Colts the the Indianapolis Colts, a disappointing season, I think, by, by any measure, did not make the playoffs reaction, and then maybe what they're thinking going forward. Well, you know, one thing I think we've forgotten is that Andrew Luck uh, left two weeks before the season started, and the, the, I think we got caught up, the Colts overcame that, got off to the 5-2 and two start, but then I think reality has set in a little bit. They're going to have to decide what to do with Jacoby Brissett. Is he going to be the long-term starter quarterback? They're, they're right. certainly paying him like one, uh, but they, they've got other upgrades to make. I think the offensive line, the running game has been a disappointment over the last few weeks. The de defense has not come as long. And so um, Mr. Ballard has his work cut out for him as he looks at the draft and free agency. All right, let's look at the uh, the Pacers. A lot of anticipation uh, for Victor Oladipo returning. The first half, the 2019 portion of the season, very encouraging, very positive. What will we look at going forward? Then? Well, they've always talked about three seasons without Victor, the transition period when Victor comes back, and then when he's ready to go full uh, full full gore uh, full bore uh, I think that uh, how he fits into the successful mix a, a team that's already established itself as a really good basketball team uh, but it'll start with Victor because Victor as much as he's done individually an all-star uh, he's very team oriented and so I think he will not try to come in and be the victor of old he'll try to be the victor that fits into this particular team All right, let's look at the state's two big uh, state institutions IU and Purdue uh, IU football in a bowl game for the first time uh, in a long time and the retirement of Fred Glass uh, what will Fred's legacy be how will he be remembered for his tenure at IU well certainly major upgrades and facility the last of which yeah. will be the uh, the golf course which has been long <laughs> much in need for a long long time but dramatic improvements to, to Simon Scott Assembly Hall mm -hmm. certainly to Memorial Stadium closing in both ends uh, they've had success baseball mm -hmm. uh, women's basketball certainly the football program but this is Indiana. This is basketball. His mm -hmm. legacy will largely be tri uh, tied to what Archie Miller does with that basketball yeah. program. Let's go up to West Lafayette and Purdue. Uh, certainly a lot of change there. Football program back on the right track. Disappointing the year this year. A lot of it because of uh, unbelievable injuries, but a lot of changes too at Ross State Stadium. Well, it? Bob Roman's come on board yeah, uh, right. for there. They're, they're building that big new uh, uh, incredible jumbotron yep. at the south end of Ross State Stadium. Mike Wilbinski's done a really good mm -hmm. job, and I, I think that was a blip with the football team. Really, injuries dictated a lot yep. of that. And men's basketball, uh, you yep. know, Matt Painter's he's got yep. a solid solid program. Yep. They'll they'll be okay. Okay, lots we could talk about. We're running out of time. Those we'll look ahead to 2020. Uh, Indy. Uh, 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 soccer, uh, yeah, the Indy the 11. Uh, 11. Thank you. New stadium. Is it going to happen? What, what, what do we think? This is a real chicken and egg, Gary, and I don't know what's certainly going to happen. They seem, certainly seem to be bullish. The, the legislature yeah. took out the MLS uh, mm -hmm. as being part of a stadium requirement be 
getting the funding, and can you make it in the league that they're in now? I don't know, but uh, I think I think we'll have some news sometime in 2020 as it relates to the long-term future of the Indy 11 in soccer. Uh, Indy. We'll look forward to that and a lot of other sporting events uh, even before we get to 2021 in the big uh, year that year, so we'll look for that, Bill, as uh, always. Thanks for your perspective, and uh, we'll see you in the new year. Yeah, Happy New Year, Gary. Okay, Thanks. Same to you. And coming up, our insiders are getting warmed up to reflect on the year that was in Indiana business and also take a look at what might lie ahead for the economy in 2020. There they are in our Inside Indiana Business social media lounge. They will be with me in studio when we return. Stay with us. Well, each week, a group of insiders joins me to offer perspective on some of the week's top stories. This week, we're taking a look back at 2019 and also ahead to uh, how the state's economy, uh, the economic landscape may be shaping up for 2020 as we head into this new year. Joining me this week on The Insiders, uh, pleased to be joined by Hollowell Consulting President Jennifer Hollowell, also IndiePolitics.org publisher Abdul Hakim Shabazz, and pleased to welcome back the director uh, for the Ball State University Center for Business, Mike Hicks, and Mike was our top story this week. Welcome one and all to the Insiders. Uh, as we look back and also look ahead uh, to the year ahead, and Mike, we touched on this in our top story this week with you, but as you look back on 2019, um, what kind of a year was it? How would you characterize the year for the Indiana economy? Well, I think the best way to think about it is to look back over a, a decade. 2019 capped a decade of economic growth. We've never had that before, not mm -hmm. since we kept records in the 1830s, 1840s. And so here's a period of time that the Indiana economy expanded, added almost a half million uh, new jobs over that time period, really made substantial improvements from the deep recession. Mm -hmm. And so maybe slowing a little bit with mm -hmm. an unemployment rate that's still fabulous. Mm -hmm. And then wage growth, so setting the stage for the future with maybe some some optimism, but some, you know, warning warning signs maybe as well after a good solid decade. Yeah, a lot of jobs announcements uh, too, uh, really for the past several years. And Jennifer, we were talking about uh, international uh, investment, Infosys and others mm -hmm. uh, making substantial investment in job commitments in Indiana. Yeah, the international investment has uh, grown 300% in the last two years in Indiana. And then talking about job growth, advanced manufacturing, life sciences and the tech industry, with emphasis, story started before now, but expected to bring in uh, 3,000 jobs by 2023. And then we have all kinds of growth in the tech sector across the state. And I think that's really a good story for how, uh, how the growth will fold over the next few mm -hmm. years and uh, and bring talent to the state as well. Abdul, as you look at the big, your, from your perspective, the big storyline from last year, from 2019. What, I think what was interesting about Indiana was the fact that if you go back, you know, trying to piggyback on Mike's thing at the start of the, the decade, you know, the, the, the situation our economy is in just struggling, trying to get back on its feet. Now we have worker shortages mm -hmm. almost mm -hmm. literally across the state of Indiana. I mean, when I saw a thing on you know, social media about all these hiring, you know, warehouse workers for like, you know, $20 an hour, mm -hmm. you know, no post-secondary education because they're just that hurting for, uh, for the workforce is even more when you get like Jim would tell you in the, in the tech trade and that skilled workforce, I think to me, that's the, the big economic impact. And what do we do, you know, about all these unfilled positions and the fact that we have so many Hoosiers that just aren't qualified to fill those spots. Yeah, and Mike, transitioning from 2019 to 2020, because workforce will continue to be a big issue. But one thing you mentioned that I, really caught my attention is income growth, because that's been a huge challenge for Indiana. But we've seen some positive uh, uptick in that regard. Right, at least the last few months. Yeah. So the, the, if there's a down story of the last 10 years, it's the, the employment growth has really been concentrated in those low-wage sectors, low-skilled workers. But maybe now we're beginning to see job growth that is accompanied by wage growth. And that sets us up for a better year less uh, you know less stagnant economic growth that accompanies the jobs that we've been growing so even if we have a slow growth year in terms of total employment because we're just out of people maybe we'll see a little bit better economic growth with that uh, income across the board mm -hmm. as we look at those storylines for 2020 I think and Mike you mentioned this earlier talent Indiana keeping talent attracting talent here is a big one Jennifer I know you work with a lot of tech companies, the tech industry. How's that all shape, shaping up uh, as we get into 2020? Quality of life improvements and all the things that communities are doing trying to make themselves more attractive mm -hmm. to talent. Well, and that's part of where I think the state has to shift some. We've we've become the low tax state. You know, we're great for uh, business. We're, we've, uh, you know, regulation, all those sorts of things. 
we're in the top. Where we're not always getting that is the quality of place, the amenities that attract people here. And Abdul mentioned on any given day, you know, there are a couple of thousand tech jobs that are unfilled because we don't have the people to fill them. So we either need to have programs geared toward training people here who can do that, but we also need to recruit people from the coast to fill these jobs. As one element I wanted to ask you about is the creation of the Indiana Destination Development Corporation. Elaine Beadle, former president at the Indiana Economic Development Corporation, uh, uh, tapped to, uh, to head that up. But this is an effort that's going to focus on tourism, but also telling the Indiana story to try to attract that talent here. That's right. I think part of the focus of it is to make it a destination in lots of ways. And up until this point, I don't think any agency or person in the state was responsible for bringing people here outside of tourism, but we need talent here. I mean, the future of the state and to be able to hit our mm -hmm. revenue numbers to do the things we need to do in state services, we need bodies. Mm -hmm. And so we're very hopeful that with Elaine leading this new effort and the state kind of rethinking branding and marketing um, beyond just tourism will be really helpful to providing the workforce that we need. Well, the old slogan used to be, it's a nice place to visit, but you wouldn't want to live there. <laughs> and so I think well, what Anne is going to have to do is, hey, not only we're a great place to visit, but it's a place where you want to live, you know, relocate your family. I mean, you think about, you know, just look at housing costs, you know, San Francisco, New York City, and how much more your dollar gets you here, you know, in central Indiana, not to mention a little bit the further you go out. So I do think, you know, attracting that talent, saying, hey, not only is Indiana, you know, are, are the people great, it's a great place to live, and your money goes a whole lot further. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mike, uh, do you think this is a good, a good approach? We were, we were talking off camera that uh, some other states have kind of cut out the kind of the public funding of, of tourism efforts, uh, this kind of quasi-public, public-private partnership, the way to go in your view? Now, much like what IEDC was mm -hmm. more than right. a decade ago, this is what other states are looking to. So the the Pure Michigan program is gone. The, the legislature canceled it. The governor vetoed uh, an effort to revive it. And I think they're spending $60 million to tell their story about Michigan. And we're going to spend a million and a half and a lot of private sector dollars do the same thing. And I think it's right. The best important part of this is not going to be attracting more conventions to Indianapolis. We're going to fill these hotels. It's going to be people to hear hearing stories about Indiana that says, yeah, that's a place I could live. Because there's a lot of good in the state, a lot of opportunity for new population growth, mm -hmm. which is the key to the next decade. As you look at regional economies around the state, and Michael, I'll ask you, anybody can jump in on this, but what, what regional economies? Fort Wayne, Northeast Indiana has been a lot of activity in downtown Fort Wayne and that region on the talent side doing a lot of things. Any particular region that impresses you or stands out to you as really getting some things done and poised for growth? Right. I think, well, obviously central Indiana is just sucking up population from around the state. But if you look at the greater Louisville area, now that there's access to uh, that part of Indiana to, to downtown Louisville because of the bridges, the extraordinary amount of uh, regional cities development that's happening in the three regions, Evansville, Fort Wayne, and then uh, the, the North Central area, are really doing very well. I think are, are places that could get to national growth levels over the next decade. Something I've noticed, uh, this is uh, from practicing law, a lot of some of the smaller communities here in Indiana, just about everybody has taken some sort of plan to rehab, to redevelop, to reinvigorate their downtown areas, whether it's uh, you know, Martinsville's, the, mm -hmm. the Terre Haute's of this world, places that used to be sort of boxed and boarded up, are now slowly but surely starting to come back to life. That shows a lot of the state's mayors say, hey, you know, we need that quality of life, once again, like Jen said, to attract that talent, and that's what they're doing by sort of revitalizing and re sort of reinvigorating their downtown areas. Flaherty and Collins, in Indianapolis-based developer, uh, Darren Kittner was on the show earlier uh, in this program and talked about how they're investing uh, the Arbuckle as a $40 million kind of a luxury development in Brownsburg. They're doing projects in Kokomo, in New Albany, in Mishawaka, in places all over the state, and again, really kind of focused on the talent attraction thing, which gets across sectors, but in particular in technology. Yeah, well, and it's important It's important that they're doing that because we have to create these spaces. And we do see, because of regional cities and other things, that some of these communities are working together more. I think that that is going to be the new trend that we see the state going in, that we need this regional collaboration. It doesn't have to end at city limits mm -hmm. because to create the environment that people want to come in and fill the jobs and work in these places, that's the kind of uh, you know coordination that we need to see. 
just starting out the new year 2020, but in terms of the big storyline you think uh, that's going to make headlines in 2020, what would it be? Every time I think about the election, I think about how my home state of Illinois just legalized marijuana. I need to go back home <laughs> because, you know, it's going to be the election. It's going to, it's going to permeate uh, everything. It's, reg it's regulatory policy. It's tax policy. You know, it's our foreign policy. The election, Donald Trump, the president, that's going to be the 800-pound gorilla in the room. Yep. Jennifer. Yeah, I think it is too. It's going to impact all the issues and the way businesses uh, conduct themselves and what happens in state government. Between us having the vice president and Mayor Pete from South Bend, Indiana is going to be a hot topic and a lot of focus here. We also have congressional races, the attorney That's general's right. race. There's going to be a lot of focus and it's going to suck up a lot of the oxygen. Yep. Give you the last word, Mike. I agree. Um, the Midwest economy, the states mm -hmm. that were so important in the 2016 election, Wisconsin, Michigan, Ohio, and Indiana, have had the worst growth over the past three years. And so we're going to see some surprising things happen, a lot of presidential attention over the next 12 months here in, in the Midwest. Mike Kicks, Jennifer Hollowell, Abdul Hakeem Shabazz, thanks for some great perspective on 2019 and also looking ahead as well. We'll be right back after this. Well, the new year means a new way you can watch our show. WFYI programming is now streaming. Uh, if you can't watch Inside Indiana Business as a regularly scheduled time on WFYI at 7 o'clock on Friday evenings, YouTube TV subscribers can watch our show there, as well as all of your other favorite WFYI favorites. Well, coming up next week, Indiana University School of Medicine researchers using cutting-edge technology to predict which triple-negative breast cancer patients may avoid recurrence in those who are at risk, high risk of relapse. It's another positive outcome of IU's Precision Health Initiative Grand Challenge. Plus, our Trendiana segment will uh, check out the new food trends in Indiana as we start the new year. Well, thanks for joining us this week. I'm Gary Dick. Go out and make it a successful week. Inside Indiana Business with Gary Dick is a production of Grow Indiana Media Ventures with support from WFYI Productions.